Professor Julia Galli graduated summa cum laude in physics from the University of Modena, Italy. She then attended the International School for Advanced Studies in Trieste, where she received both her master's and PhD in physics. Professor Galli did her postdoctoral research at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and later worked at the IBM Research Division in Zurich, <laughs> Swiss Federal <laughs> Institute of Technology in Lausanne, Switzerland, and at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where she led the quantum simulations group. Fellow of the American Physical Society, Professor Galli was, has received many honors, including the U.S. Department of Energy's Award of Excellence, the Lawrence Livermore Science and Technology Award. All were contributing factors to being chosen recently as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Professor Gali comes to the University of Chicago and the University of California in Davis and brings with her many research sponsors interested in finding more efficient ways to produce the energy. Members of the Gali group make significant, make significant use of the Argonne Leadership Executive Facility via a grant from the Department of Energy's INSIGHT program and INSIGHT the appropriate program without some acronym, innovative and novel computation impact of theory and experiment. Now on to her research. Professor Gali uses theoretical and computational methods to predict the properties of complex materials, encompassing solids, liquids, and nanostructures. She works in close collaboration with experimentalists to invent new strategies to interpret complex measurements, as well as to discover new materials with targeted properties for projects such as energy-related applications. Um, well, recently, the Gala Group uh, published a paper outlining new ways to convert solar energy into electricity via these nanostructured semiconductors, uh, which could lead to promising new materials for cost-effective um, clean energy. Her research in developing computational procedures <coughs> beyond just energy, the methods are also being used for simulating water behavior and using properties of liquids at the molecular level. Finally, today's Uncommon Core lecture <coughs> is called Engineering Materials for Sustainable Energy Sources. Climate change and the related need for sustainable energy sources to replace fossil fuels are pressing societal problems. The development of advanced materials is widely recognized as one of the key elements for new technologies that are required to achieve a sustainable environment and provide clean and adequate energy for our planet. Professor Gali will discuss how the combination of advanced <coughs> and computation with state-of-the-art experiments may lead to successful bottom-up designs of materials for energy applications. Thank you very much, and um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. And uh, so what I would like to do in the next half an hour or so is to give you an idea of how we use theory computation using very high-performance architectures, especially the one that we have close by at our national lab, in conjunction, very close, uh, collaboration with experiment to understand the materials for sustainable energy sources and uh, I'm thinking about the materials that one would use to better harvest the energy of the sun. I'm thinking about the materials that may use to for waste heat recovery and also materials that are related to the production of clean water, membranes, you know, uh, this kind of materials. And before doing so, and this may be, unfortunately, I couldn't be here uh, at Steve Seibner lecture yesterday because we had a program review, but this may be a little bit of, uh, let's see, okay, this, okay, a little bit of a repeat, but uh, before telling you specifically uh, what we are doing, I wanted to put our uh, 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 research into the perspective of the Institute of Molecular Engineering. If you have all already heard about the Institute of Molecular Engineering and you raise your hands and you tell me that you know everything about it, I, I will just go very, very, very fast over. Do you all know about the molecular engineering? Yeah, no, okay, okay, okay. So I don't have to skip all of my biographs. Very good. So, uh, so this is our new building. You may have uh, uh, this will be our new building. 
Uh, this is the library, and you may have been uh, walking close. And in front of the library, there is a new building coming up, and this is where we will move. We are still uh, uh, the guest of the, uh, uh, you know, partly of the chemistry department. So what are we going, so what, what is the Institute of Molecular Engineering? Who are we? So we are basically uh, trying to pursue a new approach to academic research and education and engineering. And what we want to be able to do, and also what we want to educate people to be able to do, is to master the techniques, experimental, computational, a variety of techniques necessary to uh, control matter at the levels of atoms and molecules. So basically, you know, we look at the materials from the bottom up. The materials are composed of molecules, of atoms, and we ask ourselves, what are the molecules and atoms doing, and can we get them to do what we want so that the materials have the properties that we want for the energy sources that we want. And um, so this is really an engineering, engineering system from the molecular level up, and the goal is to build world-leading programs in energy, information technology, healthcare, and sustainability. And energy is in blue, not because it's the most important one of the institute, but because it's what I'm talking to you about today, right? So we really have an opportunity, as you know, the introduction said, to, to create a program that transcends the disciplinary boundary from the inception. And uh, these are the kind of... Uh, uh, enabling technology teams that we want uh, to build and that we are building. And one of those is in computational engineering, theory and predictive modeling. And this is what I will be telling to you uh, uh, about today. Um, so uh, you may have seen this. This appeared uh, already in a book some time ago. And it's a good way of summarizing what we would like to do. We want to tackle engineering issues of major consequence for society. So you want to be high on the pure basic research part, but you don't only want to be like Niels Bohr, although, of course, I would actually very much like to be like <laughs> Niels Bohr. But, uh, you know, <laughs> you know uh, let aside that. Uh, and win two Nobel Prizes, by the way. That, that, that's good. Uh, but you don't only want to be that. You also want to be very high on the consideration of use. So you want to do user-inspired basic research. So that's what we do. We have a problem in mind, and uh, we are trying to get together. We don't care about uh, you know, whether we come from a physics, a chemistry, a chemical engineering department, and we want to tackle uh, big problems. Uh, what are the big problems? One is harvesting and storing or, uh, energy from the sun, recover waste energy, make available clean, uh, clean and fresh water. Steve Seibner talked to you about this yesterday and about the uh, uh, project uh, that uh, the University of Chicago has uh, with Ben Gurion University in Israel, and also, of course, you know, we want to if we don't control carbon emission, then all the rest is a little bit of a, a problem in itself. Okay, so uh, go, get going a little bit more in detail, what, what, what are the materials that we want? So we want a material, for example, to have uh, better uh, solar cells. And uh, so we uh, have a material, we absorb the energy of the sun, we create you know, uh, charges, the charges give us electricity. There are materials like this, you can put your solar cell on, your, uh, on the roof of your uh, uh, um, uh, house uh, these days. We want better materials, not only cheaper, uh, but different, okay? And we also, oops, uh, sorry, uh, I am a little bit, challenge here. Okay, so, and also materials. This is a cartoon of what could be a photoelectrochemical cell. This is a cell where you have certain type of materials that you want to optimize that have catalysts attached. You can put water on this photoelectrochemical cells uh, and that's what you want to do to split it and create hydrogen that then you would use like uh, fuel. This is by no means a new problem, okay? So if you look at the date here, this is a lecture which was given at the International Congress of Applied Chemistry in New York in 1912. And the speaker was asking, would it not be advantageous to make better use of radiant energy? 
So this is not a new problem, okay? More than 100 years ago, of course, people were trying. And this is, by the way, if you find this paper, this is an amazing paper. It's a visionary paper. I mean, this is seven years after Einstein, you know, discovered and the photoelectric effect and explained. And the guy was already talking about, look, to this, you, all the energy that nature puts at all disposals and human civilization and maze used almost exclusively of fossil solar energy. Why don't we go to radiant energy? I mean, and he was thinking about the sun. And a lot of physics was not yet there, but he had a lot of ideas. So this is really uh, a visionary guy. And I would also like to be like that guy in, in addition to all the other ones. So we want to put all kind of this uh, together. Uh, so this uh, is uh, not a new problem. We, it's a very old problem. We want to try and provide uh, and come up with ideas for new materials and a and, and new solution. And uh, another way that you can actually uh, take advantage of the energy of the sun is, uh, for example, to have uh, you know, temperature gradients and uh, another effect, the Seebeck effect, uh, uh, you can use it to, to again uh, create electricity and to have thermoelectric materials. And uh, you could use those, for example, for, for waste energy. And as I said at the beginning, the other materials that we are interested in are materials that could be used as membranes for clean water. And we have to understand the whole carbon cycle. Let me just pause for a minute. I want to present this project, but it's a very interesting project. This is a project we have been involved in for several years. It's funded in the country. It's a 10-year project funded by the Sloan Foundation and is led out of the Carnegie Institution in Washington. And this project simply asks the question, how much carbon do we have in the Earth? We actually, it's, it's unbelievable, we don't know. We don't know how much carbon is stored in the Earth. How, and, and by carbon, I mean CO2 and CH4, I mean methane and uh, uh, um, CO2. And how much carbon can move from the Earth up and contribute to the carbon that we have in the atmosphere. So this is a science project that, and you know, it's all related, right? Because why do you want really to have uh, so badly uh, new energy sources. You know, why do you want to have renewable energy sources? And uh, uh, you want renewable energy sources. One of the reasons is that uh, we have a real problem with climate change and there are zillions of papers. I, I picked one reference. There are zillions of papers, including, you know, if you bring up Google News, uh, all the discussion about climate change and uh, zillions of paper in science. But this is actually a graph, if you go to this paper, which tells you about the emission reduction rate as a function of the starting year of emission reduction. So what, and this is based on models where the author uh, considered a lot of data. And uh, the uh, uh, point of this paper is if we wait too much, we will have to reduce CO2 so much that we may not be able to do it. So what this paper is telling you is that if keeping CO2 induced global warming between 2 centigrade would require a missile reduction about 3.2 percent per year if we start kind of now, now, 2020. This is more than double if you start in 2032 and so on and so forth. So we want to think big, always, and uh, we want to be predictive. And so how are we predicting by using computation and theory in connection with experiment? So what we do, we use the fundamental equation of quantum mechanics to look at materials. So materials are made of atoms, they are made of molecules. The equation that regulates the motion of atoms and molecules and what keeps a material together, what a material does when it's hit by light or, in, in con, uh, in, uh, uh, or, or by electric and electromagnetic field are known, okay? And uh, do we do this just in, the, in a vacuum? Of course not. You need to actually have a modeling theory stimulation strategy which goes back and forth to and from experiment, otherwise you will not be predictive. You, first of all, you know, when you have a good theory, you think you have a good theory or you think you have a good computation, you need to validate it, okay, to compare with experiment. Um, so 
these are, uh, of course, I'm not going to go through a bunch of equations now, so please don't leave. This is the only equation that I have, okay? <laughs> you stay all right here. So this is uh, the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation, if you were able to solve this, this is the usual cat that we show when we start the teaching the Schrodinger equation that you don't know, you know, the poor guy doesn't know whether he's uh, alive or dead, and so he's a little bit worried about this equation, and this is the usual thing and the usual cartoon. But this is the equation. If you were able to solve this, you would understand everything about any kind of materials. And uh, so this is 1929. This is uh, uh, Dirac, uh, one of the founders of quantum mechanics. And when those guys figured it out, you know, the new theory, you know, there was classical mechanics. Uh, and uh, um, then they came out with uh, quantum mechanics. When they figured it all out, Dirac said, well, the underlying physics law necessary for the mathematical theory of part of physics and the whole chemistry whole chemistry are now known. Small detail, the equations are much too complicated to be soluble, okay? <laughs> Small detail, this was 1929. And this statement is still true and it will be true for, for many years, so probably many centuries, that we cannot solve exactly these equations. Um, so uh, what do we do? Well. What the community has done from 1930 to now in the last uh, 100 years is to reduce the complexity of the equation, so approximation. And when you have approximation, you will have to always go back and compare with experiment because nothing will ever be exact. And the major theory that uh, has contributed to this reduction of complexity is called density functional theory. And uh, the major person who uh, developed this and had all the ideas is Walter Cohn. Walter Cohn is an emeritus professor at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1998 for the development of this theory that really opened the field to material simulation. And we also solved this equation numerically. And uh, this is uh, one of the big machines that are, this is one of the biggest machines in the world, and to give you an idea, Basically, these machines can do 10 quadrillion calculations per second. I took this from uh, uh, the Argon website, and then uh, uh, I went back and said, what is quadrillion? <laughs> I didn't know what a quadrillion is. It sounds good, but uh, so it's 10 to the 15. OK, it's really, it's a huge amount. But this, this is actually a good thing. With this compute, it good, gives you a good idea. With this computing power, basically this machine can do in one day, roughly, if you use the whole machine, what could take an average of 20 years to achieve on your personal computer or iPhone. So this gives you know, an, an, an idea of the computing power. So we use a theory that we also, you know, uh, uh, and we contributed, us and other people in our field, to even improve on this theory and go beyond this theory. We solve the equation numerically. We have access uh, to these machines, and this is, again, as I said, one of the biggest machines in the world. And then we try to ask some questions. Okay, so now these questions are a little bit technical, but I would like to use this question to give you an idea of how we attack the problem. These are questions on solar cells. So one way of attacking the problem could be just to incrementally try to improve uh, what you're trying to do. But here, instead of incrementally improving what we are trying to do, we are trying to see whether we can change the materials instead of using what people are using right now, a material, a piece of silicon, like it's in your computers, which is also good for solar cells. So the macroscopic piece of materials, whether we can use nanostructures. What are nanostructures? Are pieces of matters at the nanoscale, 10 Armstrong or so, or several? Uh, tens of Armstrong that are arranged in a, a complicated way which can form a material which can uh, show different properties, completely different from the properties of the material that you just would have if you just kept using your bulk macroscopic piece of silicon or whatever. And we ask really question at the molecular level to understand how the charges would move once energy is absorbed, and how can you do from a completely different fundamental point of view, new uh, solar cell. And we do the same thing for water oxidation. This is what this cartoons uh, would, is supposed to, to mean. 
Every time you talk about materials, you have to have your problems in mind. It's not only, you know, I want to invent the best material in the world. I want to invent and I want to understand the materials that it actually does the process that I'm interested in. This is what I want to do. So, uh, again, this is technical and I will not go through the whole technical things uh, uh, unless somebody asks, and of course if you ask, I would be really happy, so please think about asking. And uh, so, the idea is, I want nanostructures, like, you know, big molecules, like kind of nanostructural materials, and I want to exploit different physical phenomena that have not been exploited before so that I go beyond the limit, which is a physical limit that we are hitting against now about the maximum efficiency of a uh, uh, solar cell. Uh, so what did we do to do that? Well, we had some ideas. The idea is we changed the structure of the nanoparticles that usually once has, and we borrowed from high-pressure silicon. Were we dreaming? No, we were not dreaming. This is a, a piece of experimental data where they confirm what we predicted, okay? We predicted something, experiments were done, they confirmed our. And now, we actually had another idea on how to embed this in a material that could really eventually be used uh, uh, in a device, although we are very far from devices yet, and this is a paper of ours which just uh, was published and made the cover of this journal, which is actually pretty cool, so that's why I'm showing this to you. And this is, uh, you know, combining a, a bunch of ideas uh, to go really towards materials that could be very useful to harvest uh, uh, solar energy. This is another idea that we had. Actually, these materials were engineered, you know, had some ideas how to make them. This is a naturally nanostructure silicon that we were studying for totally different reasons, for thermal management properties, and we asked, could we have, make this material be a good solar material? It took almost one year to convince our experimental friends to actually make the measurement, and this is sometimes uh, the sad life of a theorist, okay? You have all these ideas, and of course, many times, you know, theorists have crazy ideas, that's true. And so when you go to experimentalists, they say, can you do this for me? Usually they say no. But this is the other advantage of the molecular engineering uh, uh, vision, you know, of having teams trying to solve a problem together where everybody's convinced that, you know, you need theory, you need computation, you need experiment, and you work together. This is really the advantage and the opportunity that uh, we have here. So we predicted, I will not go through the numbers, but we predicted properties and the property were measured and they were confirmed. And now these materials are being used in sandwiches really to be tried uh, to do multi-junction solar cells. Not only were, were measured, but also at Argonne National Lab, uh, not very far away. Photocatalysis of water is incredibly more difficult compared to uh, just building a solar cell. Uh, compared to a photovoltaic effect or a solar cell, photocatalysis of water is orders of magnitude more difficult. You need to absorb light, you need a catalyst which helps you, uh, you know, with the charges created by the absorption of lights to make the chemical reaction which splits water. Very complicated. So here, uh, we explain some of the experiments that people did on a specific light absorber, and the light absorber is tungsten oxide. So, you know, what we don't want any kind of light absorber. We want cheap materials, we want non-toxic, and we want earth abundant. That's the thing. First of all, you know, when I talk about these things, people ask me, what about platinum? You know, I take my platinum, I put it in my uh, glass, and blur. Okay. This is not photocatalysis, that is electrolysis, right? There is no light involved. So you want to harvest the light of the sun. So you want a material which absorbs the light for you and then does the catalysis for you because it's the sun that you, know, you want to take advantage of. The other thing is that platinum is expensive. And there are other oxides, ruthenium oxide, for example, but these are rare material. And also, you know, geopolitically, they, some rare, earth material are a problem because they're all concentrated in some part of the globe. So if you could do this, this really with titanium oxide or tantan oxide, it would be a big deal. 
We are not yet there, but some, this is in a collaboration that we had for a long time, seven, eight years with the group uh, of experimentalists, Caltech, and uh, they came up with an idea of modifying the property of this material to make it better. We explained the experiment, and we also predicted the new uh, photoanode material. Thing is that you don't know, you don't do electrochemistry just with water. What you have to put on your photoelectrochemical cell is salty water because you have to have charges which, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, help uh, with the, uh, the transport. Okay, so are we able to uh, describe salty water? I mean, you would think that everybody knows what this salty water is, what is so mysterious about salty water. Right? I mean, uh, we use it uh, every day to cook pasta, or I don't know if maybe you don't cook pasta, but I cook pasta a lot. And so, um, okay, so actually, from the point of view of, you know, the, the, the basic property of, of salty water, you find them in every possible uh, book, and they are taught in elementary school, middle school, but, to understand what happens here, you need to understand the electronic properties of salty water because you need to understand how ions move, you know, behave at the interface, how charges go around, and believe it or not, this are, these are not yet understood. And part, this is again one of our papers we just came out where we try to contribute something to this understanding. And, uh, I have students working on this, and many people are trying to understand really the electronic properties of salty water in conjunction with uh, photoelectrochemical cells. So water, let me tell you about, at the beginning of my talk, I told you that we are interested in materials in a very broad sense. We are interested in materials for the project that we have with the Sloan Foundation to understand what happens when we have, car I mean, how much carbon we have in the earth. And we are also interested in materials for chemical reaction on rocks. And the very same methods that we use to study materials for photoelectrochemical cells and for water, uh, uh, you know, salty water, can be used to look at water at condition where you cannot yet do measurements. And uh, we did calculations that were published last year and uh, we uh, uh, did calculation about how the dielectric constant of water changes under pressure. This made us understand the water interaction under the earth mantle, and we could make a prediction of how much oxidized carbon comes up, you know, over, of course, you know, some time from the earth. And this is very important to understand and to contribute to the understanding uh, of the carbon cycle. And if you want to understand chemical reactions. You also need the electronic property of water under pressure, and this is what we did very recently, and our paper just came out in Nature Communication, and the reason why this paper uh, had some, uh, you know, attracted interest in the community is because uh, we understood with calculation that some of the experimental results that have been believed right for a long time actually were not quite correct. The data were correct, but their interpretation was wrong. So we went against a very commonly used and common practice models. Uh, and also we made prediction that now can be used to understand what happens to water in the earth. Okay, so I tried to give you an idea here about, uh, you know, how we use simulation for uh, photovoltaics, for photoelectrochemical cells, and uh, you know, way beyond the traditional materials, but, you know, for uh, what are materials, natural materials that are in the earth. And uh, I, uh, you know, hope that I give, gave you an idea that prediction of material properties using high-performance computers in close connection with experiments can bring knowledge and understanding and finally, what we hope, really solve important problems. This is by no means the only thing that uh, we do uh, at IME. Uh, this, uh, I hope this is, again is not too much of a repeat. Uh, as I, I, I mentioned in my introduction, we have at present five molecular engineering theme. One is energy harvesting and storage, and or by uh, no means we are done uh, hiring people. The other one is quantum material engineering. You have heard about water resources engineering yesterday, soft 
functional material and bioengineering and uh, biomaterial. By the way, this is Matt Tyrell, who is a, a Prisker director and uh, the dean of the Institute of Molecular Engineering. These are uh, my colleagues. We are a little bit on the side of the senior people. You know, we only have one young guy, but we are trying, of course, to hire also uh, 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 younger people. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, the, it's not the, 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 the time to go through all this, but really, all these are big five big themes. But at the molecular level, especially for people like us doing calculation of initial simulation, all the problems in materials for energy, quantum materials, water, and soft materials are all related to each other, and we can contribute our methods that we developed and our algorithm to the solution of many of these problems. Although we are better in this area here, and in biomaterials, we have a long time to go, long way to go. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge also the work of my group. This is my own research group, not uh, you know, who's slowly moving from California. A couple of people are here. You know, moving people from California takes some pushing and, uh, you know, telling a please. And, uh, but of course, uh, they uh, eventually all move because the University of Chicago is a big driver. And these are people who have been, uh, I will not read, I mean, I mentioned work by many people in passing and without details. These are people who have been with me or are with me, some moved on to other institutions. These are my senior collaborators. And I want to, of course, mention that you don't do research without funding. And these are my sponsors, uh, mostly federal sponsors. And uh, this was mentioned in the introduction. It is very, very important for us to have access to the high performance computers, uh, such as those at Argonne. And we are very grateful for the computer time grants that we have there. And uh, I'm a little bit early, but I hope that we will continue the discussion in the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, I, okay, why, why don't you? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Okay, excellent question. So uh, le le let me take a, a, you know, a couple of minutes to, to, to answer that. Uh, we are not looking at electrolysis, not because it's not important, but because we are focusing on harvesting the energy of the sun. And uh, you always have limited resources, and this is our focus. So the, uh, okay, the project that uh, uh, we are... Uh, I want to bring to your attention a, a, a link to a website because it's important. Um, so our work on the, here. So our work on the uh, photocatalysis of water is within the center. It's called uh, Center for Chemical Innovation Powering the Planet. This is a, uh, the PI of the center is at Caltech. And part of this project, uh, e there are several groups, and one is Dan Nocera's group at MIT. Actually, Dan just moved to Harvard, but you know, when we started, he was at MIT. And he came up exactly with the idea of the artificial leaf. You know, it has been in the press, and this comes from this very same problem. So it is incredibly inefficient right now, and, but we were discussing before the talk. And sometimes people, and the artificial leaf has some principle model uh, towards what people call photosyn uh, um, uh, natural photosynthetic system two. This means some specific things with them. And uh, yes, this is exactly what people with uh, certain types of material they are trying to mimic. There has been a lot of reaction in the field with Dan came out with the, his, Dan Nocer, his artificial leaf saying, oh, it's not efficient enough. Yes, it's true, it's not efficient enough now, but the principle that uh, he and others have put together are a way of getting there. So the artificial leaf is a, absolutely, that, thank you for, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Yep. Um, not really. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, they, so, uh, so you take a, 
so you uh, create uh, a temperature gradient in uh, a material, for example, composed of PN junction. And uh, depending on the properties of the material, you can take advantage of what is the so-called Sebeck effect, uh, which uh, gives you, depending on the properties of the material, if they have a certain electronic property that's also a low thermal conductivity, you know, a thermal gradient causes uh, can cause, depending on the property of the material, the creation of a voltage, a different voltage and that you can use to uh, 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 create electricity, basically. So, um, so there are several, so there is no material which has known right now, which has an efficiency which is high enough to beat any Carnot cycle or, you know, any things like that. And, uh, um, you know, some, for example, there has been a paper in Nature Materials uh, three or four years ago uh, published by people who have worked in this uh, for quite some time uh, um, in, uh, entitled, the, you know, Inconvenient Truth About Thermoelectrics, saying, you know, they will never be efficient enough. Some other people think that it's like me. It's a material problem. We haven't found the right material yet, but uh, we happen to think that by nanostructuring and looking at porous material, maybe you can find enough efficiency. The other uh, part of the community which is very interested in this is the semiconductor industry. You know, as you go down and down and you scale down, your chips heat up like crazy and you need to be able to cool them down to do spot cooling. And you can use this kind of principle and the semiconductor industry is very interested in that. Exactly, exactly. That's exactly. So there is a current in their devices. Let's use a little bit of that to spot cool where you need your device, and this is what they want to do. There are some prototypes, but uh, I'm sure maybe they have, you know, you never know what the semiconductor, they, they certainly don't come to us to tell us if they have good pro prototypes, right? That's, what are the the, the, oh, sorry. What are the early commercialized products? Okay, so. Just to give you an idea, um, I came here 1st of February. But uh, I think that your question is more general, right? Uh, what are, um, if out of our uh, past activity in, as uh, computational and theoretical uh, uh, people, nothing. Uh, and uh, although we would like to change that, uh, but nothing. But out of labs of experimental groups that we have worked in collaboration with and to which our computation and theoretical approaches have been useful to, um, in the field of uh, photovoltaics, some in the field of uh, uh, photoelectric photoelectrochemical cells, nothing yet. That's, uh, I, I actually would expect that probably there is a big center funded by DOE. The name is JCAP, Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis. They have prototypes. Uh, I would expect commercialization there is probably three to five years for some prototypes which will not have the efficiency that we still need. Oh, these are polymers. Uh, I mean, for example, um, uh, I, um, these are, hmm, I did, okay. So I'm uh, uh, unfortunately not an expert in that, but uh, uh, so mostly they, uh, uh, Paul Neely and Juan de Pablo, who are the two senior faculty, uh, who are expert in uh, um, uh, soft material. These are pol plastic. Like, you know, plastic is the <laughs> prototype <laughs> of polymers. It's not, it's not plastic what they do, but you know, the same material which uh, is, is in plastic. And now people have ways of uh, um, arranging and uh, changing the morphology of these materials so as to get specific function that they want for membranes, so certainly for clean water. These are uh, some of the problems that they have in mind, but also for templates for um, the semiconductor industry to think about new ways of doing materials for computation.
Thank you. Yes. Yes, we, uh, this is actually a very important part of what we as a theoretician and, and, and computational people do. We actually spend a lot of time ruling out certain scenarios and also ruling out uh, 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 things that do not work. Unfortunately, and on the big scale and in the big scheme, uh, this does work in our scientific community. You know, on a day-to-day -day operation, because of the hype that is out there and the rush to publish that everybody has these days, you end up never telling the community what really does not work. I mean, the big ideas that do not work, make it out there, but the small, you know, uh, things that don't work and that would be very useful to know and that we rule out, they don't make it, you know, in this big kind of journal publication just because we all want to look cool and, you know, the, the journalists we don't publish because it doesn't work. But it's an extremely important uh, part of our, of our work, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, so there is, uh, I mean, we don't do this. Uh, so again, part, uh, uh, one of our collaborator, and if you are, so one of our collaborator here, uh, Tom Jaramillo, uh, he is uh, in, in Stanford, and he's also part of our big team of the um, um, study of photoelectrochemical cells. So they did a, um, uh, economical analysis of the whole thing and uh, uh, in terms of not only of uh, you know components but uh, of uh, how much would it cost to deploy all these things right for example if you talk to people just as an example uh, doing solar cell what they will tell you is that if you use silicon today and well, of course, it depends also on the speculation of the cost of silicon, but take, believe that the cost of silicon is what it is. The major cost is installation cost. It's not the materials that goes into the solar cell. So either you have a brilliant idea what the kind, you know, we are trying to change the physical uh, thing that we take advantage of, or if you just say with silicon, we are done. You need to talk about installation costs. So they, uh, uh, to do this for photoelectrochemical cell is much more difficult. The paper has just been published, I'm, I'm sorry. So there is a whole analysis that has been done and it, uh, also it has been uh, very much pushed by the Department of Energy who they funds JCAP and all this operation. So are you guys thinking about? And um, the paper is out there. I would not be able to tell you all the steps but there, there is an analysis out there. Uh, you know, this is absolutely a wonderful question and I would, in, in, you know, we, we have done a lot of work on water and from where I stand, this is one of the most challenges, challenging basic science problem on water that we have today. Uh, so there is a, uh, I, since you, you know, I, of course, you, you know, Eric Gray, you know about that. So there is an idea. So people are trying to see whether, first of all, can we change the Helmholtz layer, right? The, the layer of, right. And also, how can we change it in the way we want by putting a certain type of catalyst and, you know, organized. Uh, but we don't know how to do that yet. Uh, but, but and, and, and one of the important problems to, organize this layer is also to understand what happens to ions. This is what I, I meant, you know, the salts. This is a, an outstanding question there.
You want me to start all over again? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I know that this will sound uh, kind of a prepared uh, answer, but it's, it's not in, you know, I'm really excited about, uh, so to, you know, th then I'll tell you the topic, but uh, I'm really excited about uh, being here with people who came here to just put it all together to solve problems. This is really I'm excited about, and I'm excited about the philosophy of molecular engineering. You know, I've been in big department before, and we, we were spending so much time deciding if, whether this was analytical chemistry, physical chemistry, and you know, all these kind of things. And, oh, you know, if you, and I, I, actually I was in two departments in physics, say, does this really belong to condensed matter physics? And here there are people, you know, here, and you know, we, want to make a difference and trying to put this together. I'm excited about this. I'm excited to work uh, with experimentalists who believe in the value of theory and computation. And uh, my own uh, you know, real excitement is uh, to understand what happens of water at interfaces and the chemical reaction of water. This is an outstanding problem. We have studied water for a long time. This is what I'm most excited about. <laughs>